So hello everyone. Welcome to the final session here. And um, you should be already ready by now. So if you've got butterflies in your tummy, don't worry. It's just some extra energy there for you to keep you going. So what I want to do today is to have a look at the audit of groups. Okay. Because of the title, uh, sorry, because of the article that the examiner put on the ACCA website, Technical Articles or AAA. And there are a few things I want to cover here. So we've got ISA 600 inside here. And uh, the first area that we want to consider here is the reliability of the component auditors in case that comes out. You need to absolutely know that. So I have arranged the acronym um, this way, E-Q-E-A-M. All right, so what does it stand for here? The first one is the experience and the professional competence. I want to focus on the word professional competence here. The thing that we're thinking about, oops, sorry, okay, this professional competence here, okay, is actually linked to understanding of the IFRS. So usually we are worried when the component is overseas and the component auditor is a foreign auditor and we're kind of worried that maybe they might not be familiar with IFRSs. So that makes our work a little more, bit more difficult because you've got to remember that in a group audit, the subsidiary financial statements will have to be prepared in accordance with the group accounting policies and the group financial statement framework. So if they are not familiar with that, if they don't have experience with IFRSs, then that's going to be a bit difficult uh, for us. Okay, so it's the first thing that we want to consider, the experience and the professional competence of the component auditor. The next thing is the qualification. A lot of the time we're dealing with a foreign auditor. Okay, not so much a, a local one, although even if it's a local one, we still have got to go through EQEAM. So the second one is the Q here. We want to see whether they're professionally qualified and licensed. Now, uh, when you're writing out your answer, if this comes out in the exam, don't forget this bit. This is important because these are the matters to consider. And if they are not familiar with IFRSs, then they, are, then they won't be able to carry out their work and they might not even be able to pick up misstatements. So that's a little worrying. So that if there is very important. You've got to remember that every time the examiner gives you this question on the reliability of uh, component auditors, the examiner would always say explain, not list. So if you just put down that part there alone, it is listing. So you need to explain. So here you've got the explanation again that if... Uh, if they're not professionally qualified and licensed, then the quality of their work could actually be questionable. So don't forget the word uh, explain in the exam question. Then you've got the compliance with the ethical requirements. And remember, we're dealing with a, a component auditor who might be in a foreign country. Of course, in your own home country, you know that they are, you know, whatever ethical code that you have is based on the ISPA code. All right, but if it's in a foreign country, then I'm not so sure. So we just need to double check that, okay, to see whether they are ethical. And then it goes on to say, if the rules are less stringent, then there might be doubts on the area of their objectivity and integrity. Okay. All right, then the auditing standards, again, we're very worried about if it is in a foreign country country so i have got the if down here don't forget it is explained so you have to explain how it how it applies to the exam question don't just plonk down uh you know a list there the examiner in the requirement would have said explain then the last one is monitoring whether the component auditors operate in a jurisdiction where the auditors are constantly being monitored for their quality. And if this is so, it will enhance the quality that, uh, of their work, enhance their competence. But if not, then we might be in a bit of a trouble. So please take note here. Um, reliability of component auditors needs to come out again. At least if you have got some of these points you should at least be able to get five marks here. Now, this is the reliability of the component auditor. And since we're talking about the reliability, we might as well just very quickly talk about the reliability of other people as well. So you can get a question on internal audit as well. 
So on internal audit, then we're following the rules in ISA 610. And if you want to assess the reliability of internal auditors, I use an acronym called DOTS. Of course, in the exam question, you will have to explain. Explain it. Uh, how do you explain it? In order for you to explain it, you have got to explain what it means in terms of ISA 610. And then you have got to relate it in this particular case. So you have to do this for all of them. Let me just color that. Okay, you have to do it for all of them. So that's how you explain. Explain what ISA 610 says about it. Then try and link it to the scenario. Otherwise, you're not explaining and then your marks would be significantly downgraded. So we're very worried about those people who have scored between 45 to 49. The examiner in the... um in the meet that we had a couple of days ago, yeah, the examiner um, emphasized that it wasn't that they did not know how to do it, <clears throat> excuse me, but they actually attempted that parts, I mean, several parts of the exam question. The only thing is that their answers were very, very shallow. They did not relate it to the technical standard. Now, uh, putting down the standard name is you know, does not attract any marks at all. That's not what the examiner is saying. But the examiner is saying, bring in the technical jargon. Bring in the technical information from the standard. Okay? Like, for example, if you're talking about revenue, then the right thing to do would be to talk about performance obligations. Then everyone will know that you're talking about IFR 16, sorry, 15. Or if you're talking about IFR 16, then bring in the part about the right of use asset and the financial liability, for example. Yeah, so try and bring in as much technical information so that people know that when they're reading your paper, that they know that you've actually gone through an AAA program. All right, so the examiner says bring in the technical knowledge down here. And um, so like here, objectivity would be that the internal auditors will have to report to the audit committee, perhaps. And in, in this particular case, maybe you're going to say that they're reporting to the finance director rather than the AC. I mean, the examiner has to give you something inside the scenario for you to write about. So these would be some of the things. So bring it in and therefore you're going to say that their objectivity might be slightly impaired. All right. Um, especially if there is already an audit committee. Of course, if there's no audit committee inside the, inside the company, then there's nothing much that you can do about it. But their objectivity is impaired anyway. Can you imagine if you are... Uh, reporting to the finance director a lot of your work that you're going to be doing is going to be on the area of finance. And can you imagine criticizing your boss? I mean, you think about it. You guys are working, right? If you can give your boss a report on your boss's area of work and then you uh, do not, uh, I mean, you are criticizing his work, he is not going to be very happy with you. Okay, so try and bring the technical knowledge and bring the information into the case. Same thing with your EQEAM as well. So here we are talking about what the standard says, but then relate it to the scenario. So sometimes the examiner would say that this component auditor uh, belongs to a network, an international network of auditors. In that particular case, then I'm sure that they would have knowledge of IFRS. So bring in the technical content and then relate it to the scenario. Otherwise, your marks are going to be significantly downgraded. We don't want that. Okay. So for assessing the reliability of internal auditors, we have got, um, We've got dots inside there to help you to remember. Okay, so today we're just running through things just very, very quickly. Since I'm talking about reliability here, might as well talk about reliability on the other two as well. So you've got 600 here, we've got 610, and then we've got 620. On the area of 620 here, we are thinking about, uh, so here, let me just write this down. So we've got, we've got dots inside here, and we have got E, oops, sorry, uh, we've got C, C O, and then I have got this thing called R E Q I. I, I love acronyms. Okay, <laughs> all right. So let me explain. So the reliability of the expert, you've got competence here. So you've got the R E Q here. So this R E Q comes under competence. Yeah, and you've got capability, and then you have got objectivity. So the I there is actually to do with objectivity. Okay, so. Um, CCO Reiki would be on the area of the reliability. How many marks would you get for this? Three. 
three marks because we've got competence, capability, and objectivity. All right. But more importantly, for an AAA paper, uh, you need to be able to assess the reasonableness of his work. So usually in the exam question at this level, this one is more of um, AA level because it's kind of simple. But that doesn't mean that you don't know it. You have to know it. But at AAA level, it's more of this applying this bottom bit to the scenario. Okay, so just remember that your exam answer will have to be split into two parts. The first part is the scope of work, where we are going to consider whether the written instructions given by the auditor have actually been complied with uh, by the um, by the expert. Okay, uh, here you've got to uh, be very careful here. There are two things here that you've got to be careful about. One is the scope of work ties up to the written instructions. This one here. Okay, and the date the work should be undertaken because sometimes if you're dealing with the valuation of, let's say, an investment property, it can be done close to the year end, either before or after the year end is fine, but close enough, all right? Whereas if you're dealing with uh, the fair value of financial instruments, then it has to be at the year end, okay? Or if you're talking about the valuation of uh, share options, then it has to be the fair value at the grant date, not one day before, not one day after. So you've got to be very careful there. So make sure that you know that. You put that down, you get one mark, all right? Don't just put there, scope of work, you don't get anything. Then you've got the relevance of conclusion here. Relevance of conclusion means, um, this word relevance means whether it is whether it can be used by the auditor or not, okay? Is it relevant to us? So here, what are we thinking about? We're thinking about a few things. So I've just arranged it in the form of an acronym. Again, I love acronyms, M-A-D-C-S. So we've got the model, the assumptions, the data has to be related back to whatever contracts or source documentation there might be, calculations, subsequent events. But on the area of subsequent events, you've got to be very careful. It only applies in certain cases, like in the case of the valuation of um, investment property, then you're right. Subsequent events does have a bearing. But, um, but if you're dealing with the fair value, uh, then fair value is always at a particular date. So whatever that happens subsequent to the year end is considered to be a non-adjusting event. Okay, so I just very quickly wanted to do that because I'd done the reliability here. Okay, so one question that can come out under groups is the reliability of the component auditor. So we've got the five marks inside here. Now, still on ISO 600 here, we've got this thing about the significant components. All right. So you got something called financially significant, and that's um, well, actually it's something very interesting in the in the standard itself. It does not specifically say fifteen percent. It just says, for example, fifteen percent. But for exam purposes, I think we all like to just take what you know something that is definite and grab it as a rule and then think about it as if it is more than 15%, it is significant. I mean, 95% of the time, it is true as far as our exams are concerned. But if you go to the actual standard, it just says, for example, more than 15%. Then you've got another kind of significant component called a non-financially significant component. I'm sure you already know all of this. So let's just have a look at the example here. So you've got subsidiary A, total assets are 20 million, and they've got an intangible insight there of 5 million. So I'm using the purple color here, yeah? So the first thing that we do is we take the total assets of subsidiary A divided by the group total assets, and I've got 20%. So is this a, a significant component? Yes, it is a financially significant component. In your exam, it really doesn't matter whether it is financially significant or non-financially significant. As long as it's significant, then there are certain things that the group auditor needs to do. All right, then you've got a second subsidiary here. The total assets are only 10 million. So again, we go through that purple calculation again, and it's 10%, and you're like, OMG, it is less than 15%. Then we need to go one step further to go and look at their financial statements to see whether we can find anything. And here we have found something here, and it's probably something that is, um, uh, could be misstated. So we want to see whether it can 
have a material impact on the group financial statements or not. So here, I'm using the blue color here. We take the 5 million here, divide it by the 100 million here, and it comes at 5%. And that's 5% of total assets. So 5% of total assets is this one here, up here. Right? So that means this particular subsidiary is considered to be a... Uh, Non-financially significant, non-financially significant because from the purple side, it is less than 15, but on the blue side, it's more than 1% of total assets. So the two calculations that you need to do, all right? Of course, the third one, uh, are, are we okay so far? We're just very quickly, um, you know, just revising, okay? Then you've got subsidiary C. And it's also got 10 million inside here as their total assets. So when I do the purple calculation, it's only 10%. So therefore, I go and look for whether there's something else that is very big inside their SOFP that might materially misstate my consolidated financial statements. I find that they've got tan intangible asset. And um, it is 500,000. So when I divide it by the group total assets, the reason why I divide it here is because I'm the group auditor and I'm always thinking about the impact on the console. And I find that it's only 0 0.5, so this one is a non-significant component. So why do I need to know whether it's a significant or a non-significant component? Because it affects my uh, the nature of my involvement and the extent of my involvement. So when you're talking about the risk assessment here, so now we're talking about the nature of the involvement. So the minute it is a significant component, I would like to be involved in the component's risk assessment. Okay, so let's have a look here. This one you, you need to know, very important. So uh, for those of you who are, are, are coming in for, my, for the first time, if you want to have the PDF notes here, just email me. This is my email address. All right. Just email me and I will send you the PDF. Is that okay? Sheila50050 at gmail.com. So don't worry too much about taking down the notes or anything like that. So risk assessment. So I want you to note here, if it's a, the minute it is a significant component, what do we do? We have to discuss with the component auditor what's going on in the component. So I've got this acronym here called IEFBI. Actually, IEFBI represents the areas of risk assessment. So what do they stand for? The small i is the industry to find out what, what, what's happening in the industry in case this subsidiary is a different industry compared to the parent. Then the entity, what's happening in their company? Are they going up, going down? Do they have new products or whatever? Okay. Then you've got the financial performance, the F, the business risks, and the internal controls. So all this is part of your ISA 315, part of our risk assessment. These are the areas that we seek to understand. So since the component auditor is already doing the audit, uh, I'm not going to do the audit because they're not paying me any fees. So I could discuss with them what they have found. Yeah. And then I, w I would also like to discuss with the component auditor, the ROMM in the component financial statements. You know, our question one is audit risk question, right? So if we are the auditor of, let's say, a company in our question one, then what are the things that we look at? We look at the goodwill, we look at the provisions, and there's so many things inside your question one, right? So just imagine that the component auditor has actually gone through that. So we're discussing with them, what have you found? What did you find when you were doing your risk assessment in that, in that component? Uh, were the provisions okay? Uh, was there adequate impairment um, for your receivables, for your intangibles, for your PPE? Was it okay? So we're trying to talk to them about it. Because if there's an ROMM uh, in the component financial statements, and if it's material, it might actually screw up the consolidated financial statements as well. So I am interested. 
And then to review, this one is slightly different. I colored it slightly differently. Review the component auditor's documentation of the areas of significant risks of material misstatement. Note the difference in the color. The first two are discussion. The third one is that you actually have got to go into the specific documentation, their working paper on why they decided that this one was considered to be a significant ROMM. Now, if you go to ISA 315, it actually defines for you what is a significant risk of material misstatement. And we've got the acronym here called FUNCA. F-U-N-C-A-R. What does FUNCA stand for? Just in case you've forgotten, I mean, I'm arranging it in the form of an acronym. I love acronyms. So if you have got your own acronym, uh, use it. If you don't have, you can use mine. So let's just quickly revise here. So why are we interested in this one here? Uh, an area of significant risk requires special audit consideration. Okay, special audit consideration. Now, what does FUNCA stand for? So we've got areas of fraud here. When you're talking about fraud here, <clears throat> we're actually talking about the risk of misappropriation, uh, sorry, not misappropriation, risk of manipulation, fraudulent financial reporting. Okay. And that one goes together with management override. So that's why in our question one, we're always looking for management bias. Yeah, very important. We're looking for unusual transactions that are outside the ordinary course of business. Any kind of new development? Uh, what kind of new development? Any new thing that has happened, a new standard, for example. Now, um, in the meeting that we had uh, two days ago, the tutor exam review, uh, the examiner said that COVID will not be taken into consideration in the exam scenario. That means the examiner says that the your scenario will be limited to the scenario. You don't have to bring in the information that is happening outside the scenario, like the effects of COVID inside there. Okay, so the uh, the the lady who was uh, it wasn't Kim, uh, Kim Smith. Uh, it, it was. Uh, so, sorry, uh, wasn't Lisa Weaver? Sorry, our examiner is not Lisa Weaver. Uh, it wasn't her. It was someone else. But they said, "Do not bring COVID inside." Okay, but in real life, you would bring COVID inside. Okay, or the introduction of a new standard like IFR sixteen, perhaps. Then you've got complex transactions, accounting estimates with a high degree of uncertainty, anything to do with fair value, expected value. Uh, net present value, yeah, things like that, okay? They all have got high degree of uncertainty because there's a lot of management judgment and related party transactions. So fun car is that. Now, I want you to note something. Why do we need to know what is fun car? Because it requires special audit consideration. How does that affect us in the exam? So remember, we're dealing with a group audit. And this is a component auditor. And if the component auditor has got any of fun car inside, then we need to make sure that they apply special audit consideration when they're auditing those areas. Right? So we have to look at the scenario and the scenario will usually show you that the component auditor has done a pretty scanty um, strategy for auditing those items. So then you can put your input in and say, no, 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 this one is requires special audit consideration uh, and therefore you need to do a little bit more. All right. Now, let's go to the right-hand side. If it's a non-significant component, then uh, you're only required to do analytical procedures just to find out that there are no significant risks. Here, it's more to find out whether there are significant risks. Here, just to make sure that there are none. So remember your risk assessment procedures, we've got AEIO. So in this case, the standard says you just do the A, don't do the EIO thing. Okay, because it's a non-significant component. Yeah. All right. Response here is talking about the work that you're going to do, the substantive procedures that you're going to do. The emphasis here is the part about the component materiality on the left-hand side. Make sure that the component auditor has carried out the audit using the component materiality. On the right-hand side, uh, we're not so concerned. On the right-hand side, they may have their own auditor. Fair enough, the auditor will do their own normal audit, but we're not going to get so involved because 
it does not have a significant impact on the console. Now, so here we're, we're talking more about substantive procedures. So what are substantive procedures? You know this already. Substantive procedures includes these five procedures. It includes substantive analytical procedures, this one, inspection of document or an asset, reperformance, confirmation, and recalculation. So for a non-significant component, all you have to do is this one. You don't have to do the others. I mean, as far as you are concerned. Uh, so let's say you are, let's say BDO, you are the group auditor. Group auditor is BDO. And let's say the component auditor here is, let's say, PWC. Let's say. All right. So PWC will definitely do the whole thing. I mean, they have to submit an opinion for their client, right? Uh, but we are BDO. So as far as BDO is concerned, uh, we are only going to do this at the group level just to see whether the numbers make sense. Of course, if it doesn't make sense, we will follow up with PwC and ask them, oi, what's going on? Okay. Now, the thing that I'm interested in today is this one, that the group auditor will review the component audit strategy. The reason why I'm interested in this is because this is to do with quality control. All right. Uh, okay, Ife says, please take FBI again. Okay, so FBI, this is financial performance is where we do the analytical procedures. This is business risk. And this is internal control. All right, this is an ISA 315. Okay. And uh, okay, let's go down. So we're looking at this. Now, the reason why I'm looking at this is because when, if you get an exam question on quality control, and you're talking about reviewing the strategy of the component auditor, then you have got two marks each. It's usually about 10 marks uh, per part, I mean, uh, per section. So in your question one, you've got A, B, C, D, and this one might take up 10 marks. It's really quite huge, so I wanna have a look at that. All right, now just now we were looking at significant risk, right? I just wanna deviate slightly and go on to ISA 701, key audit matter paragraph. Okay, so in order for you to see whether a key audit matter paragraph should be brought in or not, there has to be this framework. Okay, a framework for you to decide. So what is the framework? Um, again, I love acronyms. So I'm just going to call it PC TAS. If you have... a uh, if you have your own acronyms, please use it. Please don't freak out because of mine. If you don't have anything, don't worry. Don't lose any sleep over it. It's just the way that I'm arranging the points. It just helps me to know that there are five points here and four points there and seven points there. So it makes it very easy for me in the exam to know what's missing. That's all. Okay. So what does the P stand for? P stands for pool. P-O-O-L. So your K-A-M points will come from this pool like a swimming pool kind of a thing. So there's an area of significant risk. Yeah, it has to be one of those areas. And there are other things as well. There has to be significant auditor judgment here, but it is because of an area of significant management judgment. And usually when you're talking about this management judgment here, it's a lot of the time it's to do with that accounting estimates involving a high degree of uncertainty. And it could also include, this pool here could also include other things like items, uh, uh, significant events or transactions that have got a significant effect on the audit this year. So that's my pool, my starting point, all right, of what is a KAM. Then C here is communicated with those charge rate governance. T is whether it's been correctly treated. And then A is the attention and then S is whether it's significant for the year. So let's just go through it, whether the matter was communicated. So if you've got these items here, but they were not communicated with those charge rate governance, it can never be a KAM. All right. Correctly treated. That means it must be an unqualified opinion for that particular area. And then it says here significant auditor attention. Can you see I've colored this in red? Yeah. And that's exactly the same thing as this, significant audit risks. 
same thing. So, you know, it says here special audit consideration. Yeah. So what's a special? This is what's special. More senior people. Maybe bringing in auditor expert. Maybe bringing in consultation. Now, what's the difference between auditor expert and consultation? The auditor expert would be in a field other than accounting or auditing. But consultation is talking about an expert in accounting or auditing. Because remember, this area has got a lot of judgment involved inside here. Yeah. So uh, whether you're thinking about significant risk, significant risk, we're thinking about special audit consideration. Special audit consideration is exactly the same as significant auditor attention. Yeah. So I just wanted to discuss those two together so that you can work on it. Yeah. Relate it together. It's not two different things. Okay. So PC task here is the pool, communicate it, treat it correctly, uh, the attention, and it's significant for the year. So what is significant for the year? Anything that, I mean, you're talking about key audit matter. Key means only a few. You can't have 20 items and then call it key, can you? Yeah, so it's only a few items. So anything that involves the most amount of communication, the most significant auditor attention, and then it is material. So that's how you assess it. Okay, now let's go and have a look at an exam question. All right.